So first speaker is Riju. Riju is um, one of the guys helping us with running the website. He's going to be editing the feature articles that go on to it. Um, hi. So as as um, as Kiran uh, introduced me, my name is Riju. It's not written there. Um, I'm known better as Riju. I I'm an I'm an economist by training. So I'm a map person more by interest and and by by what is it by fortune or good friends, most probably. Um, so what we'll do is this is not a technical session at all. I'll I'll try to do a as it says a brief history of making maps. Um, some of the maps I'm going to show and talk about are of course classic ones. One of the more radical initiatives taken to rethink maps and reuse how what maps can do. Um, some of them are weird, also because it comes from very personal choices about what are the most interesting maps in the, in the world history. Um, and also some of them look weird, I guess. Um, let's begin with this map. This is, um, have you heard of Tatal Hoyuk, any of you? So Tatal Hoyuk is a Neolithic um, excavation site in, in southern Turkey, in the Anatolia region. And this is here, so this, this is, uh, the, the settlement um, used to exist during, say, 7,500 to 6,000 uh, BC. And this is, by, by some cartographers, this is hailed as the earliest example of human-made maps. That's what I do. So as you might guess, that um, the most of it shows a settlement, settlement of the Chattel Hoyuk um, place. Um, on top you have, um, which, is, which was claimed as Mount Hassan, which is a, is a volcano next to the, um, next to the settlement. And of course you see this uh, funny thing you see in older maps where the perspective changes. So this is top down, where this is a site profile. Um, and and it's, it's quite controversial whether it's a all map, because this is the actual image of how it looks. What I was showing you earlier is the, is the, is the archaeologist's imagination of what it might have been representing. So there's always, especially when it comes to older maps, it's, it's always a funny thing to, um, to talk about the exactitude of the map and to talk about whether this was really a map or it was something else. For example, anybody... Oops, so, yeah, there's nothing written here. So, so this is Ptolemy's uh, world map. And the funny thing is Ptolemy had a book in, say, 150 um, AD, and it was called Geographica. And there was no maps. There's, there's just surviving maps from that book, but there is detailed um, description about how Ptolemy saw the world. And in later Europe, in say 14th century, 15th century Europe, people started reading Ptolemy's Geographica and recreating these maps. But clearly, this is not Ptolemy's map. So if you want to really know or understand how people were thinking about maps and the world in 150 AD, um, this, is, this may not be the best way to do it. This is a very controversial map which uh, came out from China. It is claimed to be drawn in early 1400s, early 1500s. And what it does, as you can see, is it shows North America and South America before Columbus made the trip. Okay? Um, so Zhang He, and there's this lovely book called, uh, I forgot the name. Anyhow, so um, who did the, 1428 or something? Yeah, that's No? Yeah? Okay, cool. So, um, so Zhang He is this famous Chinese explorer, and, and this, this, this is supposed to be the map that he, he created. There are a lot of controversies, and it was later, again, it's, it's not the original map, it was later redrawn from the original map in 1763. And there's a lot of controversy whether most of the ideas and the shapes come from 1700s than 1400s. Um, but what is interesting is, um, you see here, similar kind of depiction, and this is, anybody knows whose map is this? No. So this is the first atlas that was created by this uh, Dutch cartographer named Marketer. And I'm sure some of you are aware of the Marketer projection. Right? So the Marketer projection comes from this Dutch cartographer. And this is the first time anybody is organizing the, the surface space of Earth using 2D perpendicular axis. And this, as you can guess, is central for uh, naval navigation. Right? You need to have a kind of access system which tells you, um, which allows you to do trigonometric calculations on the map, so as to set the course for the ship. And as you know from Columbus's experience, it was 
uh, it was it was quite something if you do not know where in the sea you are going, right? You can just go to the wrong continent. <laughs> so this marketer, um, what he has been doing is, so this is the first atlas, so he coined the word atlas. He said that this is my collection of maps and this is called an atlas. Because it's, it's carrying the, the weight of the knowledge of the world as the, as the real atlas in, 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 in the, the atlas food in Shah. Um, I'll just run down to another map. This is WG Blackie, another very famous uh, cartographic company who uses uh, marketer's projection. But what it does is, so marketer created the mathematical formula for this perpendicular, perpendicular axis system. Here what he's doing is he's flattening it out. And this is almost the map most of us are familiar with from our school education, right? Because marketer maps remains the, remains the most monolithic or important image of how the world looks. Of course, again, most of you might be familiar with the controversy with marketer map. You can see that the Antarctic and the Arctic areas are expanded to infinity, and the equatorial regions are squeezed. And this is obvious if you're trying to create a 2D surface from a 3D surface, and if you're just spreading it out. There's another, um, so projection, right? So this is the issue of projection. There's an interesting um, idea in the, in the history of projection. It's called the developable surfaces. Anybody know what a developable surface is? Can you tell? So, uh, if you take three objects, uh, tear, them, tear the surface off, and then unravel it, uh, unravel it, uh, you get a, a 2D planar thing. For example, imagine a kerosene can. Uh, if you want to uh, unravel it, you get a warning. So developable surface is also it's a particular form of 3D surface, which you cannot, which you can unfold or unroll into a 2D surface without tearing it. So the point is, you if you tear it, then you would have tears appearing on the uh, on the map, right? Which is not a great thing to have. The very interesting again mathematician architect Buckminster Fuller. I'm sure again some of you must have been knowing him. What he started doing is he was very uh, excited about. Um, dome structure, so geodesic domes is really his, his passion. And what he was doing is, um, he was creating 3D surfaces which you can unfold and um, create into a 2D surface, make it into a 2D surface. And of course the obvious idea was to see if you can draw the, draw the earth on the 3D surface, unroll it and make it work like this. This might not be most efficient for naval navigation as you can see, but it really, um, it's, it's really more accurate than what marketer has been doing. A more famous version of, again, uh, Buckminster Fuller's map, which kind of, which is a very interesting picture of how the, how the land mass of the, of the world are mostly connected, which is not how it appears in Marketer's map, really. So if you, if you look at it from Arctic, it, you see how everything kind of um, works together. So from Arctic, let's go to the opposite side, and this is another funny situation where the, where the technicalities of map making, of projection, and the political issues come together. So do you know how Antarctica is, is politically divided? So there's a political map of Antarctica. And as you see, it's, it's rather arbit. I mean, how, how, you, how you carve up a place where nobody really lives, right? So what people do did was to do the obvious thing that you follow the, the lines that you have and have these pie slices belonging to different countries. So that is how Antarctica has really been cut up. So the logic of it comes from maps, and comes from how the, the space in, in Antarctica has been already imagined. And with these imaginary lines, and then you, then you get the political boundaries on top of that. I'm mentioning this to, to just remind that politics and maps have a very long uh, history of working together. Anybody knows what is this? It's written probably. So this is a map of the fort of Bangalore, which no longer mostly exists. Um, interesting again, these maps were created by British armies, which were invading, uh, which were attacking the fort, and it was created to help the British generals to make decisions regarding where to attack the fort, um, where to attack the fort. It has these very interesting locations of cannons on the fort wall, and you, if, if at least people here at least can see these red lines which show all the cannon uh, lines, okay? And there's a larger map and it goes down into the environs 
and you can see it, it tells you where the British Army should be avoiding, which parts of the of the of the pit area right here. <coughs> the same thing, this thing about maps and maps giving the generals a sense of what to do in the in the battlefield, it of course continues till very recently, right? And this is the famous map of how Osama bin Laden would be captured and would be bombed in the what is the mountain? The Tora Bora Mountains, most probably. Yeah. It continues with the Iraq War as well. It tells you that this is Al Assad airport, here are the WMDs, and this is why we need to attack Iraq. The reason I show you is to tell that what I was talking about earlier about the navigational usage of maps and the importance of maps to be exact, to be accurate, to help people to move around places, suddenly change, suddenly maps change. Or go through transformations that do not satisfy those functions anymore. Here, the importance of the map is more in terms of a knowledge claim, more in terms of saying that the US government knows enough about Iraq to attack Iraq. It's a kind of a posture, right? And that again has a, has a long history. So this came out in the early 20th century. And this is, this is almost the beginning of a famous series of octopus maps. Here, whatever the, the enemy power is identified as, is always depicted as the octopus. Right here is Russia, and how Russia is engulfing, is eating up the whole of Europe, right? So this is not the only map. And finally you have, so this is Russia and this is Europe, and there is almost no China here, right? Now what happens when Chinese people start ma making the same maps, right? Then you have a huge China, not so much important Europe, the same Russia as the octopus, yeah? And of course you have Stalin as octopus, you have Churchill as octopus. Of course everybody gets a right to be an octopus. And you have Putin as octopus, it's quite recently, 2008, right? And again I'm showing this to talk about the rhetorical, the, what to say, the, the, the discursive logic of, um, of maps. It tells you, it does not only tell you what is there on the land, it also tells you how you see the land, how you see the space, right? Interestingly, just to uh, um, come to the next discussion, you have, you have a geographic boundary and you have something sitting on top of that. Right? And this always has been how maps work in a, in, in a big way. Everybody knows about it, I'm not going into this one. But just to tell you the fact that there is a, there's a road network map, there's an infrastructure map, and then there's a mortality map, all on top of each other, right? So that, that, is the, that is the key functional logic of how maps work. And this is not working, this is not happening only now because we have digital data. It's happening over a long time. The techniques were different. This is happening over a long time. Again, a very famous image, I'm not, talk, not talking about it at all. You can always know what is this. The same thing happens. You have a, you have a, you have a region, you have a movement path, you have a number of army personnel, you have temperature, all on top of each other, all layered on top of each other, and that is exactly how maps work. What really happened with GIS, and this is one of the earliest um, GIS maps for urban development or understanding urban uh, spaces developed in India by BVMP, of course. Um, what happened really with GIS is, unlike, say, John Snow's map, or cholera map, or um, the um, map I showed you right before, the, the movement of Napoleon's army, what happened with GIS, with information system, and information system embedded, or um, maps created by information systems, is there was, a, there was a separation between the information and the map. And this is what allowed for, so right here, what we see is the map, but what it is created out of is not the map. That is information. Right? So we have a form, we have a final form which is different from the original form of how the, how the map is, is stored, is, is held, is used. And that's a very fundamental change that happened with GIS. Unlike, say, for, for John Snow who is making the Conera map, he has to work with a layer, a real layer of road network information which is in the shape of map, which is not in the shape of a JSON file. And that really made the difference of what can be done with um, digital maps. 
Of course, jump to 2005, and this is this is the big moment, of course. This particular map is quite famous one. Um, Google had a minor bug, and if you search for Russians invade Georgia, Google was showing certain regions in Georgia which is being uh, invaded by Russia. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a funny bug. But anyhow, but of course, 2005 and Google Map, and it, it's it's the it's the beginning of a very different era of mapping, right? The difference with so what Google Map allowed you to do, and as you were seeing, the, the separation between the map and the information is that Google Map is giving you, we all know this, I'm just repeating, it gives you the base map. You have your own information, you take it, you put it on the map. There's Oliver O'Brien, and there's a bicycle share map of London. And that is really cool, right? So you don't need to have your own geodata. As long as you have your own geotagged data, you can take somebody else's base map and just put it in. Sometimes, even if you do not have base map, your geotag data is already so powerful. There's Eric Fisher, a very a fantastic coder, an artist, who took all the images, the, the, the location of the images that was taken around in New York. Um, blue is by people who were visiting New York. Red are by people who, uh, who live in New York. Right? And just to say, sorry, the other way around. Red is people who are visiting in uh, New York. Blue is by people who are we live in New York. Just to see how, where in New York people from outside, when where in, where in New York people from New York uh, click pictures. There is, of course, right. There is there's no, um, there's no base map here. There is only geotag data. If you see the Facebook world map, it's a Facebook map of uh, friendship, something like that. It's again the same thing. There is no, geo, there's no base map. The, the geotag data is already so powerful that it can create the shape of the world. At the same time, if, if Eric Fisher's or say Google or Oliver O'Brien's, their initiatives were to take information that has already been created by other people and collecting it together, collecting it together, and that was the attempt. OpenStreetMap, which we were talking about right now, um, took a very different approach. It said that for some parts of the world, this is how the base map looks, right? Any guess where this is? This is a very famous OSM example. Chennai? No, this is not Chennai. <laughs> this port of Spain in, in Haiti. So this was during the when the earthquake uh, hit Haiti. Right? So what uh, OSM did is, we do not have maps of certain parts of the world, we do not have geotag data, but we have recent satellite imagery. And we have a lot of people working with us all across the world. So what we can do is we can use that satellite imagery and start doing the what to say, the, the thick descriptions, the thick mapping of the places. The point of interest data, the thinner data, what is this place is actually called, if my house is here, that can always come from the people living there, and that can always happen later. But at least the overall idea, the road networks, a brief kind of um, land usage pattern, um, can already be created by people living um, across the world. Right? And this is a very, very different um, approach to mapping, of course. Um, Ushahidi took a different way. It said that, see, we already have the Port of Spain road network data being created by OSM. What we need is to, is to locate people in it, right? So what it did is, the, as you know, the Ushahidi um, platform, what you can do is if you're messaging from particular places, or you're going here and submitting that, I'm talking about this place and this is the problem hitting there. This is again Haiti and they're also doing um, reconstruction support work. And uh, anyway, um, and using this particular form of geotagged um, uh, crowdsourcing of information, in crowdsourcing of geotagged information just to, just to help the, the, the work. If those things were done by people outside the place, this is the Kiwara map, again a very famous case of open street map. This is done by people in where they live, right? So this is Kiwara slum. Um, just to give a quick view, this is how Google shows the place. Um, it's okay. It's okay, it's okay. It's fine. Um, so uh, this is how um, this is how the place has been mapped by people, by residents of Kibera, with the help of um, certain people, of course. Um, I'm, I'm running really. 
If those things were about, sorry, didn't? Um, so if those things were talking about real maps, by real maps I mean real world maps, so the distance in the real world should be proportional to the distances in the, in the map world, those kind of maps. If those talk about creating a database, and of course it does, which can rival the proprietary geodatabases of the world, and it has to be that accurate to challenge it sufficiently. There's again, along with that, there are very different kinds of um, cardinals in the, mapping, in the mapping world. This is again quite a famous um, map created by this group of artists, activists, called the Situationist International. Um, nobody, anybody knows about that? Okay. So this is France, this is 60th, 17th France, mostly Paris. Um, what they were doing is they were talking about the fact that let's not let's not get stuck with the real the real distances in the real city. Let's talk about the mental city. Let's talk about the mental maps we carry when we move through cities. For example, I stayed in Shantinagar, and my friends are quite angry with me that over the two years I mostly travelled between um, the Shantinagar bus stop to to MG Road and Commercial Street. So that's, that's the kind of area that uh, so anybody who's familiar with um, Bangalore would understand. This is the kind of area where you can, which you, which you can walk in, say, in 30 to 40 minutes max. Okay? And I quite made a point that I'm not going to any place to eat or to something or to, to have a beer beyond, beyond, beyond that region. Right? Mm -hmm. So that was really my mental map of Bangalore. That is how, so for me, Bangalore is probably now, I guess, because of these people moving to CIS, this is, Dongdu is becoming part of my mental map of what exists in Bangalore. It was very, it was very localized, it was Shantinagar, MG Road, Church Street, double road kind of a location, Lalabad Max. So what they were doing, what they were talking about the fact is that, so these are the neighborhoods where we live, which we move around. What is in the middle, we do not know, we do not have a right to talk about either. So this is not a map of how Paris actually is, but this is a map of how a certain group of people perceives Paris and lives in Paris, right? If that was about how a certain group of people lives in Paris, in actuality, this is a, this is a project in New York where this group of, um, where this organization named the Institute for Applied Autonomy, what they did is they mapped all the surveillance cameras in New York. And if you just give a endpoint and a, a beginning point and an endpoint, like Google Map gives you a pedestrian path, it gives you a surveillance free path. So what it does is, if, if, um, if Situations International were saying that how you perceive the city, let's talk about that. They say that if you want to do certain things in the city, um, I give you some information about the infrastructure in the city already, and you can make your decisions regarding living in the city based on such information. Right? Um, this is, anybody familiar of the image? Okay. So this is Christian Nold, um, largely worked in UK. Um, this is a fabulous, fantastic map of, what he was doing, this is in Greenwich. What he was doing is he created a, what is it, a light detector kind of a machine, which, uh, which um, keeps track of your biorhythms, so your heartbeats, blood pressure, stuff like that, right? And, um, and he got a friend, blindfolded the person, got a GPS, and walked through the city of Greenwich. And what you get is geotagged uh, information about the emotional, uh, biorhythmic behavior of human beings across the city. And it's not only in Bangalore, clearly in Greenwich, the busy traffic crossing really has a huge spike. Right? So it also gave, so mapping is also about creating these new information about the city. This is the same kind of work, so you can guess that if you have spikes and you have different heights, you can create a topographic uh, map out of it. It's impossible to read, but that's a separate question, I guess. Um, okay, almost there. But at the same time, you do not have to use such sophisticated machine learning as Christian Nolte does. This is by Kai Cross, and this is yeah, probably my most favorite map of the model. It's very simple. What it all is doing is, it's taking information already there, putting on top of each other, 
and treating something that is really striking. So what it does is it takes the size of Africa and it fits in different countries, not according to not according to market uh, projection, but according to the, the real size of continents, right? So you have China here, you have India, Eastern Europe, US, Spain, France, Germany, and Italy, and UK fitting roughly in what's this place? Great. Everybody knows the place. So, just to finish, two last points, okay? Um, okay, anybody aware of what this is? London? Anything more? So this is Stephen Walter, a graphic designer. And as I was talking about the Situationist International's uh, map of Paris, of um, a, a map which talks about how they perceive Paris, this is a map of London treated by Stephen Walter. And it's talking about how he perceives London. And it's not only about neighborhoods, it's about every damn detail of the city. Okay? So if I just zoom in a bit, you have... So this place is apparently pleasant. Um, there's some very interesting points, like secret lives of poverty. And now, so all, all of these, all of these, what is it, point of, point of, info, uh, point of interest data clearly comes from the, are, are clearly are biographical, right? Clearly comes from how Stephen Waters have moved through the city and have understood or seen the city. Uh, the point I want to make is that this is clearly not a digital data. But at the same time, there's a lot of digital information of similar kinds, sometimes geotagged, sometimes not geotagged, which do exist, right? And when we are mapping, um, we are not only crowdsourcing information, but it's also possible to individuate the crowdsourcing process, to find how individuals um, move through cities and, and create, create data while moving through cities. So what I'm saying is that if this is giving a very claustrophobic sense of the city. Similar claustrophobic sets of data is also possible in digital formats. At the same time, again, I'm, I'm just provoking you to think that how, how this might work for what you're doing. Um, a lot of it is about using that, that very thick, very messy data um, in certain ways. And among the certain ways is this fantastic um, um, so all the, all the subway maps, the UK, the London tube map is really famous, right? So this is Tokyo uh, map, created by this fantastic information designer, the, the godfather of them all, Richard Woman. And what he did is, he took the very messy um, subway map of Tokyo and treated a map that actually gets you where you want to go, which is the Imperial Palace, right? And that's also the point, that there exists this messy, there even this very thick, um, sometimes urban, sometimes non-urban data. Some of that are geotiles, some of them are not, some of them are more exact, some of them are not. Point is, of course, to work with that messiness and also to produce um, maps that you can actually use. And maps that actually filters through all that messiness and tells you or helps you to do the things you want. Thanks a lot. Essentially, I think in summary, I'm trying to understand. Uh, okay, we move from an indi individual's perception of a map to what a cow perceives or what you on the uh, feet on the street perceive your ecosystem. But how do you collate all this data? How do you first collect it? Let's get to collation maybe later. Uh, what uh, barricades do you face? Yeah. GPS, or five, those are cool things that are coming now. But I'm a little disconnected about how you did in Haiti. Um, I'll, I'll do a brief response. Anybody else wants to say that? Hello? Yeah. Okay. So there's one aspect of it which is in terms of community building, right? And which I thought maybe Sajjad or Kiran might want to respond on. Which is about creating a community which really worked in Chennai and Bangalore and we have. Excellent open street map, um, um, maps of Chennai and Bangalore, um, which is an important part. But of course, also what you're asking is what kind of technical possibilities there exist. Um, Barriers, more of a technical barrier. But how do you get it? Uh, if it's like, right. as far as the GPS, I can't afford it. Things like that, you might have experience. Right, so one thing is, of course, um, a lot of us would have a smartphone. And you already have a GPS there. For accuracy. 
but accuracy is an issue. But then again, it also depends on, so first, the thing is that, if accuracy is really an issue, you, you take data from a lot of people, and you see how, how, the, how the error margin can be minimized using data about the same place from multiple people, right? Which is why you see OpenStreetMap has an editorial panel which is looking into, um, for each area mostly, which is looking into the kind of data people are contributing to ASM. Um, right now, Mapbox, a couple of days back, got a, got a grant from the Knight Foundation to make OpenStreetMap more user-friendly. User because clearly the, the interfaces, uh, the techniques involved in, in contributing data back to OpenStreetMap, um, it remains a challenge, I, I think you're right. At the same time, there are other kind of, um, am I eating into somebody's time? Yes. Please yes. tell me now. Okay, so the last thing. So the other kind of people like Foursquare, which takes the same data from you, which makes you part of the community. I won't always tell you that the fact that they're taking the data from you. Uh, Google Mapmaker does the same thing. It, it asks you to contribute the data, but you can never take it back from them. So that's another kind of um, working with digital data that works, but maybe we should discuss this later. Thanks. Thanks.